So what I want to do here, I want to bring us all down to our hearts, to get us in touch with our hearts. Because at the end of the day, that's what this is. That's to get in touch with our hearts and our deepest desire of the heart. And the catechist, I'll just read you one more section here, just a small section on prayer. Because in order to do this, and I'm telling to, to Scott about this, but we all got to know this. In order to get in touch, how do I get in touch with my desires? You got to be quiet. You got to sink down. You got to be in prayer. And St. Therese of Lisieux said this, for me, prayer is just a surge of the heart. It's a simple look turned toward heaven. It's a cry for, of recognition and of love, embracing both trial and joy. Prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart. Always heart, heart, heart. Jesus is always talking about the heart. He always wants to get to your heart. He wants to make this real. He wants to encounter you. And he wants you to encounter him. So again, prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart to God or the requesting of good things from God. But when we pray, do we speak from the height of our pride and will or out of the depths of a humble and contrite heart? So I, I want to ask you to go on a little adventure here to the heart to kind of start this out. Kind of go deep a little bit just to get in touch with your own heart. I'll tell you another, you know, I love young people. John Paul loved young people. He used to say, you know, when these young people would come to see John Paul, he was getting older, you know, he was getting um, sicker. He would say, you're not coming to see an old man, he would say. You're coming to see Jesus Christ. You're coming to see Jesus Christ. And that's who they were coming to see. They wanted to hear something true and good and beautiful. And they knew whatever John Paul was saying, that it touched their hearts, right? So I want to sink down just a little bit. So I do the same thing when I'm talking to kids. I'm just honest with them. I want to give you a reader of meditation from Padre Peel. You remember Padre Peel? Does everybody remember Padre Peel? Raise your hand if you, if you don't know who Padre Peel is. Okay, so there's a few. Okay, so I'll give you the quick thing. So Padre Peel was alive when I was a boy. Talk about unbelievable, right? Padre Peel had the stigmata for 50 years. The wounds like Christ in his hands, his feet, and his side. My father was in World War II. He's still alive today. There's not many of them around anymore. And so he was going to tell a story. I'm going to tell you a story a little bit later, a true story. In fact, I have his picture here about Father Columban, who met Padre Peel and his life was changed. But anyways, Padre Peel could bilocate. He could tell if you had a good confession. He'd wait for you to finish. You finish your sins, right? He's a special guy, so a lot of the GIs would come home from the war. So I have a devotion to Padre Peel that was passed down from my dad, so I want to read you a meditation from him to start this. It reminds me, because I was in a class, again, 15, 16-year-olds, my heart goes out to them. But this is a lesson for all of us, so I'm not just talking about kids here, right? And so, I, I, you know, if, if you work with kids, you throw out an icebreaker, right? An icebreaker, you just want to get them talking. You throw something out to them, you want to get them talking and, 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 and just loosened up a little bit. So I threw out an icebreaker, and this, this girl raises her hand to answer the question. I said, yes, young lady. And she said, call me they. You know the pronouns, right? I'm not going to explain that if you don't know what that, what that means right now. So I said, why do you want me to call you they? And she told me, I'm non-binary, gender neutral. Some days I feel like this, some days I feel like that. And I'm looking at that girl, and she was very sincere. And your, your heart has to go out to them, you know? You don't know what people go through. I don't know what any of you have gone through. But we've all been hurt, right? And the only way to react to that little girl or anybody is love, huh? That's the two main commandments, right? That's the only two commandments we have. Love God, be filled with divine life, and love, and then go love everybody else. And I'm looking at that little girl, and I said... Do me a favor, will you? She's looking at me. And we're connecting. I could tell we connected. And I said, I'm a simple guy. I just walked in. I, got, I had a little team with me. I said, I don't even know your names. Now i got to learn all your pronouns. I don't know if I could do this. Just for now, can you do me a favor? And we'll change it up if you don't like this. We'll go to plan B in the next session. But just for now, can I call you a beloved child of God? 
And she slowly went, yeah. And I said, how about you? Can I call you a beloved child of God? And she said, yes. I looked at the guy in the back, you know, that, oh, man. And I said, can I call you a beloved child of God? And he said, yes. And I said, me too. We're all beloved sisters and brothers in this room, aren't we? We're all beloved children of God. We all have a common heritage. I asked her if she would do something with me. I asked the whole group if they would do something with me. And I said, see, we're all getting blown around by the spirit of the age up here, and we want to go deep into the heart. And I told her some diving stories. I'm a diver. I have brothers of mine that are master divers. So we go on these liveaboards where you're diving five times a day off of these boats. We never even hit for six, seven, eight days. We never even land anywhere. You do want to say five times a day, diving five times a day. One day we're in Turks and Caicos, beautiful place to dive. Reefs are deep, 60, 80 feet. And then you get to a wall that just goes down forever. It's like a reverse mountain, it's just the deep, they call it, dark. And so anyways, one day we're, it's really rocky. We almost didn't go diving. And I'm trying to get to the edge of the boat just to jump off. I got my fins and I got the tanks and I'm, whoa, right? With the, with the uh, mask on. And finally, two people help me, and I, boom, I dive into the water. And I sink down about 10 feet, and then 20 feet. And about 30 feet, about halfway to the reef, I look down, and it's just awesome down there. The beauty and the colors and these big fish coming around. And I look at the top, and I can see the boat bobbing like this, right? The bottom of the boat. And the white cap's up there. But here, ooh, it's peaceful. I can hear my bubbles just, right? So I want you to just do that with me. If you've meditated before, you just kind of breathe in four, right? And then breathe out eight. And just sink. Because this is a crazy world we get blown around. And just sink with me for a couple of minutes. Just come down. Breathe in. Just breathe out. And just feel yourself sinking beneath the waves of this world. And when you get down to the heart, you see all these things. Uh, you, you're, everything starts to open up. Because we have much more on the inside of us than we do on the outside, right? Every one of you has more to reveal from the inside than what I see on the outside. There's things in you that nobody knows, right? Your spouse doesn't even know some things. Your closest friend doesn't. The only one that knows those things is God. And when you go down into the heart, you just meet two people there. You and God. And, of course, God brings everybody from heaven that you can meet. And you bring all your stuff with you and all your baggage and loved ones. But you touch there. And you can meet there and the whole world opens up. Are you sinking? I'm going to do this meditation called Abandon into the Divine Arms. It's from Matthew 16. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. And when we hear that, what do we say? We say something like this. But I fear following God. I fear letting go, right? Padre Pio's assurance is this. Oh, how well protected is that soul whom God has gathered beneath his wings. Yes, she can well sit down and rest in utter peace in his shade. For he who fills her with many graces will not allow her to, fa to fall. Jesus wants her holy for himself. Let this precious jewel renew her faith. Let her cast herself with sublime abandonment into the arms of God. And he will fulfill the plans he has for her. It is the Lord who works within you, said Padre Pio. And you must do nothing except leave the door of your heart wide open so that he may work as he pleases. Let the Holy Spirit accomplish what he wants in you. Abandon yourself to his transports and do not fear. He is so discreet, wise, and sweet that he cannot do but good. And I'm going to say a short prayer to you. And then if you could repeat it back when I'm finished to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if you feel like doing that, right? I'll say it to you, and then you come back, and we'll start this, right? Enter, Lord, and do as you will. And they all said, amen. Amen. It feels good to do that once in a while. John Paul II, 
came into Denver. I used to live in Denver, World Youth Day. People didn't expect more than 50,000 kids there. They said American kids don't know how to come to these pilgrimages. pilgrimages. 500,000 people tried to get into Mile High Stadium when John Paul was there. Was anybody there by any chance? I was in this little place last week, and, and, and this lady was there, and we started to banter like this back and forth at, at, about it. It was an amazing experience. <clears throat> Anyways, John Paul was coming in on a helicopter, and those kids realized he was in that helicopter, and that, that noise just went up, and the helicopter pilot said the turbulence was so much I had to veer off. And he landed in the parking lot, huh? John Paul II came in. You know, John Paul was an athlete. He was a mountain climber. He loved to play soccer and sports, but he was also an artist. He loved to write poetry. He loved to be in theater. So he had this charisma about him. And he walked in, and he had that crozier. And it's in the back there. It's got the bent cross on it. Every time I see that, I think of John Paul. It's back there with Mother Teresa. And he walked in, and he has this Christmas, and he looks at everybody. And he, you know, he's making this eye contact. And you can, you can feel the energy in there. And he walks up to the micro microphone, and he says, be not afraid. And he just went crazy. They knew what he meant. Don't be afraid to love. Don't be afraid to live. And those young people would come to John Paul II, and they said, John Paul, we see all the pain and suffering in the whole world. What can we do? What should we do? And John Paul said something very profound to them. He said, the future of humanity passes by way of the, does anybody remember? Family, right? If you want to eliminate the pain and suffering in the whole world, you have to begin by eliminating the pain and suffering with who man is to woman and who woman is to man, within marriage and the family. Why? Why there? Ah, we're the Imago Dei. We're the image bearers of God's love in the world. And John Paul takes us back into the story, and we follow Jesus. And that's what we're going to do. It's the most fascinating thing. We're going to follow Jesus into the beginning. What was it supposed to look like before sin entered the world? And Jesus takes us back, and you'll hear him take you back to the beginning twice in this passage. Genesis 1, which is the objective sign, and Genesis 2, which is our experience of living that sign of love. Before I do, he's going to talk about divorce in here. And I'll say a couple of things during this, this mission that are going to touch people's hearts. Jesus always wants your hearts, so I'm going to warn you about something. He knows we're broken. He knows people in this room have been divorced. He knows we've had relationship issues. He knows we've had all kinds of things. Jesus knows and he wants you to start right here and come into the story. So you can't blame yourself. You have to have mercy. You know, the second word for love is mercy. God's hanging there and he has mercy for us. He knows we came into a world that already fell. He knows we didn't start original sin. We might have added to it, right? We have concupiscence. I'm saying this. I used to know what was wrong with my marriage. It was my wife. If she could only be a little kinder, nicer to me, right? And then I found out it takes two, huh? It takes two. So don't go to each other. See, honey, I told you if you would have been nicer to me. You can't do the blame game and stuff. Jesus knows where you're at. Are you okay with that? Otherwise, we can't go any further. Jesus wants your heart. He wants to take you where you're at and bring. He knows we're on a journey here, right? I'll give you a couple of examples just to make sure you get this. How about King David? A man after God's own heart. Do you remember what King David? He saw Bathsheba when he was supposed to be out being a king and fighting wars. He brings her to the palace. She gets pregnant. And what does he do to her husband, Uriah? He has him killed, right? Anybody do that in here? No? Okay, so you're better than that. How about St. Augustine? St. Augustine is this passionate guy, right? The doctor of the church. He's passionate about God. But he didn't start that way, right? He was a man of the world, a womanizer, actually. Never did marry that woman that he lived with for 15 years. Had his only son out of wedlock. How about Mary Magdalene? 
A friend of Jesus who was there when Jesus rose and the body wasn't there anymore. Jesus excised seven demons from her. This is what Sister Faustina would say. I'm really just want to make sure you guys, I let you off the hook, right? This is what Sister Faustina says in her diary. All grace, grows, all grace flows from mercy, and the last hour abounds with mercy for us. Let no one doubt concerning the goodness of God, even if a person's sin were as dark as night. God's mercy is stronger than our misery. One thing alone is necessary. Listen to the heart again. That the sinner set a, a jar, the door of his heart, be it ever so little, to let in a ray of God's merciful grace, and then God will do the rest. So Matthew 19. And we're going to be led past the boundary of fall and sin into the beginning. And the Pharisees came up to Jesus and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man and a woman shall leave, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one. So they were no longer two, but one. Listen to this. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? Why did Moses allow divorce? And he said to them, listen to the heart again, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. So today we're going to go to Genesis 1. The objective sign, and this is the opening scene. You've got to think, do you know, have you seen The Lion King? The opening scene from The Lion King, right? You've got the sun behind the mountain. Boom! Right? The light goes on. And, and God's filling this all in. And I'm just saving time here by saying he's got the plants coming in. Right? He's got the animals singing. And he's all ready to go. And what does he do now? He has built the paradise, huh? He has built a place to have a wedding feast. A wedding feast. And what's he going to do? You're going to hear in Genesis. I'm only going to read a couple of verses. God draws back into himself now. He's got everything ready for you. And then he says, how am I going to get my life, the inner life of God himself, the inner life of the Trinity, how am I going to now make this visible in this world? I got this all set up. He's excited now. He's got like a selfie on him. And now he's going to flip the selfie. And he is going to project through some bodies, he's going to bring his Trinitarian love story into this created world. And this is how he does it. God, let us, God says now, let us, he's not alone, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the cattle, over all the wild animals and all the creatures that crawl on the ground. And then God created man in his image, in the divine image, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, saying to them, be fertile, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. What was the first, what was the first commandment? Did you just hear that first commandment? This is before Moses now. What did, he just, what did we just say? Yes, which means what? Have marital union, sexual union. You know, you could say sex and God in the same sentence. See, God created it. He thinks it's beautiful. We distorted it sometimes, right? But it's the beauty of that. Don't be afraid to talk about sexuality, the beauty of being created male and female. That might be the most important thing you'll ever know about what it means to be human. I started to get a little inkling of this when my wife was pregnant with our first child, Jessica. And, you know, I was up with her... her trying to coach her, trying to help her breathe, right? I wasn't doing a very good job because she sent me out. And I was down here. The doctor said, Jack, come over here. And Dr. Rita, he's a great guy. We became buddies. And uh, he had me all scrubbed up, right? I had the PPE on and stuff, right? And I'm down here with the doctor. He said, Jack, we're going to deliver a baby. Are you ready for this? I said, sure. He says, well, you're going to deliver the baby, he tells me. And uh, I was a ball player. So I thought, I got this, right? I'm going in, right? Send me in, coach. And I was feeling pretty good about it, actually. And, uh, 
I was pretty cocky until I saw a head come out of somebody's body, right? I said, honey, there's a head coming out of your body. And she goes, I know, and she's pushing, right? Of course, the doctor was never going to let me have anything to do with this, right? And he, he professionally went over, delivered this baby. But when they handed me that baby a little while later, I looked at that, the awe and wonder of another human being, huh? And maybe 45 minutes later, when my knees stopped shaking, I sat down and I go, holy cow. Nine months before that, huh? Nine months before this event, the two, my wife and I, became one, right? Physically one. And then there was a love bomb explosion that went off at that time called the baby, right? There was an instant, a moment in time where my wife and I, the two became one, became three. That love bomb explosion is called the zygote, huh? That zygote, it's a single cell, has 100% of Jessica, my daughter's DNA in there, 100% of her human genome. And that zygote is the only structure that can contain that. And every cell in Jessica's body came from that cell. She has, a, she has an XX chromosome. I have a, y, a YX, right? Men have a YX. Women had an XX sexual chromosome. That is in every cell of her body. I could take a hair out of her head and bring it to the lab, and they could tell that that's a girl, right? It's a powerful thing, huh? Every cell in your body. So what does that mean? What is Trinitarian love, huh? What does that mean to be Trinitarian love? We... In this two, become one, become three. Three persons and one reflecting in a sacramental way. The inner life of the Trinity, three persons and one. You ever wonder what that is, right? It's still a mystery. God is not a sexual being. He created our sexuality to be an expression, right? This created expression of Trinitarian, the inner life of God himself. Three persons and one in a sacramental way, reflecting back in a tiny little way God's Trinitarian love in the world. What do we know about that? The father pours his love out to the son. The son receives that love. And it's so beautiful and profound, it comes out in the form of a person. What do we call that person? The Holy Spirit, right? A man pours his love out to his wife. His wife receives that love. And it's so beautiful and profound, sometimes it comes out in the form of a person. And for us, we call those persons Jessica and Jacob and Jillian. When you understand the beauty of how we're created, you know, we, we look at ourselves sometimes, we have no idea of how God looks at us, right? St. Catherine of Siena said, become who you are and you would light the world on fire. St. Athanasius, an early church father, and the doctor of the church said, the son of God became man so that man can become God. Huh? This is the way God looks at us, a little different, right? The Pope's whole thesis on this, on this theology of the body, listen to this, it's so profoundly beautiful. Your bodies, in fact, your bodies alone make visible the invisible, the spiritual and the divine. Your bodies were created to transfer into the visible reality of this world. That mystery, hidden from all eternity in God, and be a sign of it. What is that mystery hidden from all eternity in God that we're a sign of? God is an eternal exchange of love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We were created to be an expression of love. Love does not get into this world unless we bring it into the world. The opposite then of love is not hatred, not at least in the beginning. Love is this gift, this pouring out of oneself to another, right? This is my body given for you. This gift that we give to one another, this pouring out, and we'll get into that more. The opposite of that then would be what? Grasping and taking. The opposite of that is lust. The opposite of that is pornography. The opposite of that is looking at somebody to use them instead of love them. Can you see what the culture has done to us? It's totally twisted it around. We love things and we use people. 
it's really something, and we need to all talk about this so we could bring this beauty into the world. Only once you understand this do you really understand marriage and the sacrament of marriage. How many people today are confused about the sacrament of marriage? How many young people say, well, I'm not even going to get married? They really don't see the beauty in this, right? In the beginning, before sin, what I just described to you was the primordial sacrament. All of creation, right, the beauty of the stars, the mountains, reflects something little about God. God created it to do that, right? He said, ooh, that mountain's so beautiful, the stars are so beautiful. But the crown of creation, what really brings God's love story in is us. We're created Imago Dei, each one of us in the image of God. That means reason, intellect, free will. But the fuller sign is when you give yourself away to another person. The fuller sign is marriage, the family. The fuller sign is that love story. When sin came in, there was a separation from God, and there was also a separation from one another, right? Do you remember what, what happened when sin came in? Did Adam and Eve, they did what? What did they, what did they put on? Do you remember? Like loincloths, right? Where did they put those loincloths? On their ears? On their eyes? Where did they put them? On their sexual parts. Why? Why? Didn't God create everything good? We just heard it was good, it was good, it was good. Yes, very good. What changed is how we look at one another. They put them on to protect themselves, right? So don't, you don't look at me in a certain way, right? And what did they do? They hid. What should they have done? They should have exposed themselves. God said, Adam, where are you? Right away, Adam, where are you? I want you to come back into the story, right? Such a beautiful thing. In the beginning, it was just a primordial sacrament, just that one sacrament before sin. Now we have seven sacraments. Each one of those sacraments is a way to come back into union and communion with God, into the spousal relationship. I want to get to marriage, but let's just talk about a sacrament for a second. A sacrament is a sense-perceptible sign, we see it, that affects what it signifies. Every sacrament has two dimensions. It has a divine dimension. God is going to pour grace into our lives. And it has a human dimension. We have to do something, right? God, it's always a partnership with human beings. We have to be, we're free. And God, you know, you cannot love if you're not free. You can't force your wife to love you. I can't be forced to love my wife. It has to be free. This relationship has to be free. So God says, I will pour grace into you, and then you'll do something and meet me, right? So let's think about baptism. There's every human dimension has two, two elements, form and matter. So I'll just take you through this quick. Baptism. So baptism, we have the form of baptism. You know, we, we have certain words that we say, certain things the priests do or the deacon does, right? That's the form, the words. We've got the godparents there. What's the physical matter in baptism? Water. And what does it signify? Cleansing, right? We're getting ready for the, this is a nuptial bath. I'm getting clean so that I can come into union and communion and make love basically to God, right? To receive God into my life. How about the Eucharist, speaking of that? We have certain, you know, form in the Mass. We have certain words that we do, certain readings. But then we have the epiclesis, right? Where, where, where the priest is going to say the words of consecration. And then what happens, right? The Holy Spirit comes down. That's the form. What's the physical matter? Bread and wine, right? So how about marriage? How about the sacrament of marriage? We have the form, right? What's the form? We say these words, huh? I come here freely, totally, without reservation. I'll be faithful to you forever, and I'll be fruitful. We'll be open to life, right? That's the, that's the form, the words. What's the physical matter when you get married? What's the physical matter in that sacrament? What is it? Consummation. What does consummation mean? The sexual act. 
So people say rings, they say all kinds. It's your bodies, right? It's your bodies are the physical matter. It gets consummated when the two become one, open to life. That is when the grace comes in and gets poured into your marriage. You know, that's why the church teaches about contra you shouldn't contracept. It has nothing to do with how many children you have. Did you know that? I mean, that, you know, the church wants you to discern that, pray on that, talk to a priest if you want, whatever. But it has, it's really nothing to do with that. What that is, it's the sacramental sign. It would be like the Eucharist, right? To receive the Eucharist, and instead of consuming the Eucharist, I put it in my pocket or I leave it in the pew, right? It hasn't been consummated. So when the two become one, open to life, that's when the grace comes in, right? It's a trini Trinitarian love story. The father loves the son. The son loves the father. It's so beautiful and profound. It's open to life. It's called holy communion. So when you make love to your wife or your husband, you're entering into holy communion. That's what the church teaches. That's what the sacrament of marriage is about. Can you see how that could be profaned in today's times and twisted and distorted into things like, again, like pornography and stuff? You're making holy communion, just like the Eucharist is holy communion. And those two sacraments become one great sacrament because it's Christ himself that comes into our union then, right, and purifies us and sanctifies us. John Paul would say to, at his men's conference, conference, he said, men, before you make love to your wives, take your shoes off, for you're entering onto holy ground. How beautiful is that, right? Every time you make love to one another, you're renewing your wedding vows. I come here, you can almost say that sometime to one another. I came here freely tonight. I give myself totally to you. I'll be faithful to you, right? And say those words and make love with the lights on then, right? Naked without shame like it was in the beginning, huh? I had some friends of mine, uh, Russ and Laura, and... They were married 32, 33 years. And uh, they, were, they were like these gooey couple. You see some people that were married 32, 30, and they're just so in love and holding hands. And like, you know, she would get up and he would move back and open, they were at mass, you know, put the, 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 the pew, the, the uh, kneeler up. And, you know, I mean, he was just so tender with her. And this is a big dude. And one time after mass, I said, you know, what is it with you two? You like, act like little kids, you know? I said, you know, in, in my heart, I'm going, I wish I had that in my marriage, right? And I, and I, and I do in certain aspects. And uh, so they said, it's, Russ said, it wasn't always like that. He said there was a time where, where, you know, our marriage was up and down. Jack and Laura was standing right there, beautiful woman. And uh, he said, uh, it was up and down. You know, we, we got along pretty well. But he said, then Laura got really sick. And then she almost died. And I, so while she was really sick, I would go to mass. I started going to daily mass. And I started to pray for her. As I got closer to Christ, he said I was taking Christ and I found the strength and then to go to the hospital and to be with her and to show her my love for her. And it grew. And my love for Christ grew. Well, anyway, she recovered. And we started to go to mass together, daily mass. And that's how you know us, Jack, from daily mass. And he said, um, one day, I'm looking up at the cross. And I go, oh, that's how much God loves Laura. I'm called to love like God loves. How do I do that? And I looked up at the cross again, and I realized that's how much he loves me. When he pours himself into me, that's the only way that I can, I can turn this around and love Laura as God does. And he said the reading that day was Ephesians 5, which puts this all together. This is from St. Paul in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church, because we're members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
And St. Paul goes, for what reason should a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two become one flesh? This is a great mystery. And I mean in reference to Christ and the church. It's Jesus who left his heavenly father and his earthly mother to become one flesh with you. And how do we do that? In the Eucharist. When all the smoke and fog clears, our deep yearning, burning desire to love and be loved points directly at the Eucharist and God's desire to be in union and communion with us. I want to read you a poem that talks about this. There's a Spanish theologian, Father Quran, that writes part of this, and then the German poet. It's so beautiful. The woman with her limitations, awakens in the man who is also limited a desire for fullness out of proportion with her capacity to answer it. She awakens a thirst she's unable to quench, a hunger she's unable to satisfy. This is what gives rise to the anger and the violence that married couples so often experience and the delusion they feel if they do not understand the true nature of their relationship. If husband and wife do not encounter what that sign is pointing to, the place where they can find fulfillment of the promise that the other has aroused in them, then they are condemned to be consumed by a pretension from which they cannot free themselves. And their desire for the infinite is condemned to remain unsatisfied. And the German poet René Welke identified very keenly, keenly this drama in loving relationships, sensing that ending up in this spiral cannot be the only way out. This is the paradox between the love of man and women. Two infinities meet two limitations. Two infinite needs to be loved meet two fragile capacities to love. Only in the ambit of a greater love do they not consume themselves in pretension and not resign themselves but walk together, each toward a fullness which the other is a sign. If you do not love Christ, beauty made flesh more than the person you love, the later relationship withers because Christ is the truth of that relationship, the fullness to which both partners point and in whom their relationship is fulfilled. Only by letting him in is it possible for the most beautiful relationship that can happen in this life not to be corrupted and die in time. It's powerful, huh? It's beautiful. I want to end with a story about Padre Pio. My dad, like I said, was in World War II after the war. He, we're from Chicago, and him and his buddies have a plane, had a little plane. And they would fly into this plane into Atchison, Kansas, to the Benedictine Monastery there. We had relatives that were monks there. And um, they would hunt. They had 2,400 acres at one time there. And they would let these, these uh, uh, guys coming out of the surface, my dad and his buddies, hunt there. And then they would have dinner. My dad was a professional chef. They would cook dinner with the, with the priests and the monks. And they had a great time. And my dad was talking about Padre Peel. And Brother Steve, who, we, who was a friend and a, and a relative, said, Jack, my dad's name is Jack, too. He said, Jack, if you want to know about Padre Peel, why don't you go ask the new priest here? And he said, I would love to do that. How do I find him? He says, gave him some directions. He says, you won't miss him. He's the only black priest here. And so my dad finds him, and the door is ajar, and he knocks on the door, and the door is ajar a little bit. And Father Columban is there, and my dad says, hey, I heard you were in the war. I was in the war. I heard you were a sergeant. I was a sergeant. He said, um, and he says, well, come in, soldier. And he said, but I don't want to talk to you about the war. I want to talk about Padre Pio. He says, ooh, I know something about Padre Pio. My dad said, and my dad is blind now, but when my dad tells the story, he gives the face of, of Father Columban, and he said his whole face changed. And my dad's face still changes when he tells the story. And um, he said, yeah, come on in, and I'll tell the story. He said, we were fighting in North Africa, and the, the fighting was brutal, and we crossed the water into the boot of Italy, and we were fighting up the coast, and we got to this town called San Giovanni Rotondo, and we were stationed there for a few days, and a, and a couple guys from my outfit came, and they, they had commandeered a jeep, and they said, hey, Sarge, come with us. You're Catholic. 
We've been taking a beating here, Sarge. We need to go to confession. But we found out there's a priest up in the mountains there. And he has the stigmata. And not only that, he could tell if we had a good confession or not. And we want to have a good confession. And Sarge said to them, he goes, ah, I'm not Catholic anymore. I don't need that stuff. I haven't practiced this since I was a young boy. He says, you guys go. He says, Sarge, come with us. No, you guys go. One of the guys said, I think Sarge is scared to go to confession to Padre Pio. He's going to know all his sins. And Sarge said, I'm not scared. I'm not scared of anybody. He says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to confession with that priest, and I'm going to blow him out of the confessional. He didn't know Padre Pio very well. So they get there, and they get in line. And it's a long line coming down the mountain. And it's going very slow, you can imagine. And Sarge says to the guys, he goes, you know what? We're never going to make it. We've got to be back at a certain time. And disappointed, they start to walk back down the mountain. And somebody at the top says, Padre Pio wants the American GIs to come to the front. The pilgrims can wait. So Padre, uh, so they turn around. They go walking up toward Padre Pio. And they put Sarge in the front. He has rank on everybody, right? So he's standing there. And the next person that came out, he goes in. He said he, he said he hadn't been to confession since he was a little kid. And he's doing the best he can, but he's speaking English. He, Padre Pio mumbled a couple things in Italian. And he said, I, I, I thought it was done. I thought I told him everything. I thought it was done, and then he didn't say anything. So I thought, well, maybe I get up and leave now. And Padre Pio called me by name. He called my name out in English. And then he said, when you were a young boy... You wanted to be a Catholic priest. You persevere. You're going to make it out of this war. And I want you to go see somebody that you met a long time ago at the Benedictine Monastery, the abbot there. But the abbot's not going to be there when you get there. But you go there anyways. He said, I hadn't thought about that since I was a little boy. I hadn't told anybody I wanted to be a priest except for my parents. He said, I even forgot about that dream. But those words touched my heart, he said. And something happened to my heart. And he said, I started to cry. And when I walked out from that confessional, I was a changed man. Something like scales again came off of my heart. I was a different person, huh? He went to the Benedictine Monastery after the war. And sure enough, the abbot had died two months before he got there. But he stayed there and became a priest Anyways, and I want to tell that story because at the end of the day, you look at Father Barry, you look at the priest, you look at Father uh, Padre Pio, Father Columban, who I have his picture here if you want to see it, while he was in the war, and then afterwards when he became a priest. The other one is of, of my brother, I'll tell you about tomorrow. Is that they skipped this earthly marriage, and the good priests that I know are fulfilled. That's the story I'm, we're talking about today. How do they do that and they're fulfilled? And you know what they do for us? They point us to what? They point us to the marriage of the Lamb. They point us to where we're going. So we just came into where we started from, right? In the beginning. What was that model like? We're in this fallen nature. Where are we going? And they're that icon. They're the ones pointing us to there. They said, I can be fulfilled here in this life, right? I pour, so even if we're married, we have to take Christ in deeply so that we can give that to each other. You cannot give what you don't have. We have to be filled with divine life so that we can give divine life to others, right? And then what do we do? What, is it, what does a good marriage do for Father Barry and for the priest? They look back at you and they go, ooh, that's the type of intimacy God wants with us, this closeness, this tightness. So I'll end here with just... If you think I'm making this up, this comes right, Father quoted the catechism. This comes right out of the catechism. Number 221. God's love is, this 220 and 221. God's love is everlasting, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. Through Jeremiah, God declares to his people, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have continued my faithfulness to you. But St. John goes even further when he affirms that God is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us first. God's very being is love. 
by sending his only son in the spirit of love in the fullness of time, God has revealed his innermost secret. God himself is an eternal exchange of love. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And he's destined us to share in that exchange. Again, your yearning, burning desire to enter into marriage, to be in love, points directly at the Eucharist and Christ's desire to be one flesh with us. That's one great sacrament. All right, so I'm going to give you just three little things to remember and to think about. If you try this tomorrow, three simple things. And share it with your family. Tell your young people especially in the morning, and do this yourself, before you look at that phone that's going to bring, could bring good things in, but it usually brings a lot of garbage into, before you look at your phone, go to your knees. Knees before the phone. If you can't make it to your knees, you can't make it to your knees. But knees before the phone. I do this every morning. First thing, don't look at that phone. Get down to my knees, right? Be it done to me according to your word. I always think that our blessed mother is kneeling with me at the Annunciation. Be it done to me according to your word. What am I doing? I'm just starting my day and opening my heart up to him, right? He loves me. I love you back, right? Simple. Second thing, tell your young people and all of us, pray with temptations. Temptations are not a sin. Does everybody know that? Temptations are not a sin. We're inundated with temptations all the time. What do you do with temptations? Pray with temptations. This is such a key, especially to young men. Tell them, pray with temptations. See, we're told in this horizontal play, we, we only have two ways to deal with this. We can push all our temptations down. We call it the starvation diet, right? Or we can indulge. That's all we can do. Take God out of the picture. We're either trying to be good men. We stuff it down, stuff it down. Don't look at this. Don't think about that, right? The starvation diet. Or we indulge. And these poor guys I work with that are addicted to pornography, they're trying, they push it down, push it down, and then boom, they indulge, and they're back, and they go like this, right? What happens if you starve too long, right? If I'm on a starvation diet, I get hungry, and then they indulge. They get the fast food diet, right? The key is the third way. Pray with temptation. I'm tempted. I don't try to stuff that down. See, God gave us our passions and desires. The problem isn't we have passions and desires. The problem is with our misdirected passions and desires. All I'm going to do is take those same passions and I open those up to prayer. I'm tempted. Look, at I was going. You got a new Costco, you said, Father. I was going down last week to Costco. I was, on the, I was going down the aisle. And I looked up. And I'm no spring chicken anymore. I looked up at this woman coming down the aisle. And I go, ooh, she's so beautiful, right? And I mean, it stops you. God gave us that. The beauty of masculinity, femininity, right? You know, we're, we're, tr we're supposed to be sacramental sign of the inner love of God himself. This is a passionate thing that happens. Now, I am free to, to look at her, and right away, what do I do? I lift her up to prayer. Thank you for the beauty of that woman. Thank you, God, for the beauty of that woman. To reflect some of your beauty into the world. And I offer her up in prayer, and I say a prayer for her. And I say a prayer that God comes into my heart and keeps it clean so that I can look at her as a sister or brother. Right? Pray with temptations, number two. Number three, you have to be a gift to others. I went down to my knees before the phone. I'm praying with temptations. I start to fill myself. And then I have to be a gift. I have to go out and do something. Right? I have to turn. I have to flip the selfie off of me and go be kind to other people. Be kind to each other. Say hello to your spouse in the morning. Be kind to the dog. I don't care what you do, but be kind. Move out into the world and flip the selfie. It'll start to change your life. Now, those three things, right? You got it? Knees before the phone, pray with temptations, go out and do something good right away in the morning. Those are easy things to do. You get in the habit, it's amazing. Now, we're going to need grace for that, so that takes mass and the sacraments and blah, 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 right? But we're doing those things already. These are simple things to do. Share that with your family. It'll start to change your life, right? All right, should we say a Hail Mary? In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Let's say it together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And they all said amen, right? Hey, thank you. Great to be with you. Well, we want to thank you, Jack, for some inspiring words tonight. 
and we're looking forward to the next two nights of more depth in this great subject you're talking to us about. Um, I want to just offer a thanks for you guys who came tonight and those who watched on our live stream. And the mission continues tomorrow night. We have mass at 6 o'clock and then the, the talk at 7, so you can go to mass and hang out and talk, and then we'll have the talk. And then we'll have confession available tomorrow night if you want to go to confession. And then Tuesday, of course, is the final concluding talk, and we're going to have the Blessed Sacrament exposed for a while, and it's going to be a very beautiful time for prayer. And then, of course, the week continues of retreat. Wednesday night, penance service. Thursday night, holy hour at 6. And Friday, the station's at 3.15 or 7 or 8 o'clock in Spanish. So, And then let's all come to the fish fry at the end and have a, a good round up to the, to the retreat. Uh, so I want to thank you all, and may God bless you all. Have a good night, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks hey. be to God. Thanks, everyone. Take a look at this picture.